All right, welcome to This is Crucial. Uh, Charlene and I are here, and uh, we have been looking forward to this evening for a while. Uh, she'll be introducing our guest tonight. Bless you all for showing up to share in our real talk and sacred exploration of healing justice and racial equity. Uh, as we say at the beginning of each one of these episodes, these conversations are not about presenting expert commentary or giving you a list of uh next steps or telling you how to do things. They are about sharing our lived experience, our questions, our uh, fears, our prayers with each other. Uh, and so tonight we begin from that place. Charlene, uh, would you like to introduce Mark? So I'm so excited about our guest today, um, who I actually met a little bit over a year ago not in person, virtually, of course, but I've long had his books in my bookshelf and have been inspired by his honest and courageous ass assessment of where the church is at, the Christian faith, all of these things. Um, but our paths crossed because Mark Laberton served as the senior pastor of the church I get to serve at right now, First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, uh, prior to his current post where he serves as the president of Fuller Seminary. So I enjoy any opportunity to be in conversation with and learn from and hear from you, Mark. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's my honor truly to be with both of you. So thank you for asking me. Thank you, Mark. Um, the uh, one, one quick note before we get started, uh, I, we do encourage you to use uh, the chat functions in both YouTube and Facebook to direct questions our way. Uh, these conversations are best when uh, we get to share in the conversation with those of you who are watching. Uh, those questions will get relayed to us and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can, comments as well. So uh, I encourage you to, to talk back at us as we, uh, as we reflect to you. Uh, Mark, um, begin with, uh, let's begin with your origin story. Uh, Charlene and I, over the, over the, this past year, as we've been doing this, um, we have, uh, we've often started here, uh, because we recognize that, uh, we have, uh, similar stories about our, uh, experience of walking into a room or maybe sitting in a school cafeteria and noticing that we are outsiders, um, and so uh, our friendship, really, the reason, one of the primary reasons we remain friends is because we've got a shared origin story. And so, Mark, uh, fill us in. Where'd you come from? How'd you I get here? Yeah, I was raised in Washington State and uh, from a homesteading family and uh, a lot of long-term connections with central Washington. So I, for most of my childhood or a large part of it, I was living literally in the house next door to the house that my father was raised in. So that was a very big sense of place. Uh, you couldn't drive with my dad anywhere without him telling stories of the places, the corners, the houses, the businesses that he had known. So a very deep sense of, uh, of rootedness and, and gratitude in the, for the natural beauty and for the for the um, the vitality of and and love really of both the natural world and the cultivated world, um, which is a great deal of what his own business was. My mom had grown up in Eastern Oregon. Um, she uh, was the uh, a, one of four daughters, and her mom had been left as a widow uh, and a keeper of a wheat ranch in Eastern Oregon. Four little girls, no electricity nor indoor plumbing um, and they were uh, raised there for many years and uh, and she was the kind of lady who was not prissy but she was definitely a very dignified lady who wanted to be sure that her daughters went to bed on sheets that for example had been ironed so I'm using that as, a, as just an example of a sort of attentiveness of a life of poverty uh, but a life of uh, of dignity and uh, she eventually came to live with us. And for most of my childhood, uh, that grandmother was very much a part of our family in every way. And uh, she shaped me, shaped our household and continued to extend the dignity that had been part of her own motherhood uh, while, while her girls were growing up. Those four girls would literally go to school, grade school, one room schoolhouse on the back of Tony the horse. So we have lots of family pictures of the four girls 
uh, wearing dresses that my grandmother had made and hair that she had done. Uh, and then on the back of Tony, they would go to the school. And, uh, and that was a picture that I think grounded my own sense of, of what it meant to be a family, what it meant to be committed to a place, what it meant to be committed to education, to kindness, um, really, really, really important. And so you grew up in Washington as well. Yes. I so did. what led you to ministry, to um, scholarly education, to the path that you've been on now? My dad was a really uh, wonderful man, uh, an inventor, an engineer-minded person, a person who um, who just had a lot of curiosity about the world. And he wanted to raise two sons that would do everything possible to be explorers and, uh, and engagers. Mm -hmm. So he uh, saved certain neck veins often for the discussion of religion because uh, he thought of few things being more helpful to a life of discovery than the life of religion because it was his view that religious people and Christian people in particular uh, take great things and make them small. And um, it's a pretty evidently proven thing, whether it's historically or in today's newspaper, we could uh, easily open up screenshots of the papers that are reporting on Christian smallness, you might say. It wouldn't necessarily be called that, but it shows up in that way. So uh, as I was going off to college, I had just a native curiosity about many things, and I was particularly interested in becoming what I thought of as a more educated person. And among the many books that I thought uh, I would read while I was in college, the Bible was one of those. So I started uh, reading the Bible and was just really curious. And especially when I got to the New Testament, curious to discover how much Jesus and my dad had in common about this theme about uh, small making religious people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what I discovered was that his response was very different than my dad's. My dad's response was to avoid it at all costs. Jesus's response was to invite us into a world that he called the kingdom of God, which was the thing that really cracks open all of reality. If you want the most expansive vision, uh, the deepest vision, the, the most uh, encompassing vision of what it means to be human, um, then live and flourish inside the kingdom of God, which has created, made, and redeemed all things for God's glory and purposes. Well, that just completely electrified uh, my mind and heart. Uh, I came quietly to a confession of faith that was really very deep. It was clear to me through the gospels that if you follow Jesus, you were in, you were in ministry. That, that just seemed like the obvious thing. The scariest thing to me was the church. Uh, not an uncommon thing for a lot of people. Uh, and I think um, maybe the, the a, a day that would be the most telling was this, that after about six or seven months, I came home from, uh, from college and I had told my parents that I had made this decision to become a disciple of Jesus. And uh, my dad was just crestfallen. And my, my mom um, was awakened in certain ways, talked to a a pastor that she knew said that her son had had this religious experience. Um, and he asked uh, if he could then come and call on me. So I was home for spring break and on a perfectly wonderful day, uh, up rolls this pastor to have a conversation with me. The first pastor in that way that I'd ever met under these circumstances. And we had some awkward conversation. And then he said, I've come for three reasons. The first is that, that uh, your mom's told me you've had a religious experience. The second is, that that might mean you're going to become a pastor. Now that was literally about as far from my mind as anything I could imagine. And thirdly, he said, if you do become a pastor, I wanted to make sure that you knew which denomination had the best pension plan. <laughs> that is hilarious. I'm sorry. That is so funny. Stunning. So I tell my parents this at dinner and, uh, and my mom is just, so chagrined that this had all happened and sorry that she'd agreed to the whole thing. My dad sat there very quietly and uh, he was a gentle guy. And he said, now, you know, Mark, this is, is it not exactly what we've been talking about? That <laughs> don't you suppose that, that this guy like you had some day in his life when he thought he was beginning to know the God of the universe, 
But here he is 40 years later, 50 years later, and all he has to offer you is a job and a pension plan. And my dad was exactly right. And, and it was emblazoned through that single encounter that, that this could take exactly that trajectory, mm. um, that it was possible to be devoted to smallness. And that is not the gospel I had discovered in the gospels. That was not the nature of the kingdom of God. That was not what it meant to be a, a vigorous disciple. And yet that reality was always right at the door, right? It could always turn that way. And so um, it was a shock to me when a number of years later, uh, I did feel like I wanted to go to seminary. I went there not to be a pastor, but to get more theological education for what I thought was going to be a life in the foreign service. Um, in the process of that, many things happened. And I determined that I, that maybe I really should and could consider possibly being a pastor. I was highly resistant to that idea for the reasons that I just said. Um, and, uh, but I ended up uh, eventually becoming a pastor and, um, and then was ordained actually at first, uh, I was ordained at University Press in Seattle, but I was ordained to the position that I had when I first came to Berkeley, which was the college pastor position there. Yeah. So what are you saying to, what is your, the version of your spiel that you're saying to seminary students now? Because I'm assuming give, it's not about pension plans. <laughs> don't pursue a pension plan and don't get <laughs> into smallness. Um, so every, every fall, when we have our opening convocation for new students, I preach on the exact same text, which is Romans 12, 1 and 2, just to say um, everything is meant to be a radical act of worship and everything is meant to be a process of being utterly remade, where the perceptions that we have need to be rewritten by uh, God's power through word and spirit to transform us by the renewing of our minds that we may prove in action what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, and that those things are heart, mind, and soul expanding realities, uh, and that hopefully everything about their time in seminary and in the future will continue to be stretched far beyond any kind of easy, myopic vision of the world, of ourselves, of our neighbor. And this is, this is a big part of my, tra my transformation really, because right off the top, as I was reading the gospels, it was so clear that Jesus's sociology was cutting across all kinds of lines that, that were clearly not the lines that had been drawn for him as a, as a, a faithful Jew. And, and likewise, how easy it would be for me in light of my own background to simply share my own traditional lines and then let my faith only fit the size of those small boxes. But what was clear to me from the start was that Jesus was rewriting that whole script and that it was a reordering of my sociological reality, my world, the, my people, my tribe, my, uh, my communion was going to be completely redefined by a reality that was so much greater and so much more profound than than, than any other source that I could imagine. So then the question became exactly in response to that horrible conversation with the earnest but misguided pastor uh, was to, to not cave to smallness. And uh, it's not about greatness either. That's not the goal. It's, it's myopic as opposed to capacious. And uh, and I, I want to be a capacious Christian in the way that I think Jesus is a capacious Christian. Mm. Mark, uh, first time I read any of your work was uh, just a few months ago. Uh, I think in 2018, you gave a, uh, you gave a talk at Wheaton College uh, to a group hey. of uh, evangelical leader's and um, uh, I, I reread re that uh, the transcript from that talk just the other day as we were preparing for today. One quote caught me. Um, you said, uh, right alongside the rich history of gospel faithfulness that evangelicalism has affirmed, there lies a destructive complicity with dominant cultural and racial power. Amen. Yeah. I should yeah. have said that. Yourself, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we could, we could probably spend a second talking about uh, your definition of evangelicalism for us mainliners over here yes. uh, or 
in in Dallas, but I'd I'd actually rather just get right into the dominant cultural and racial power that the church has been complicit with. Right. Can you name those with any more specificity? Sure. Um, first of all, I, th- I think it's right that it shouldn't be attached only to evangelicals, but evangelicals um, are, are certainly a group that has um, wanted to lead with simply declaring what they see as a neutral gospel, um, which is not neutral and which has always been, as every gospel is, ultimately set in a cultural frame and in our own lived experience. So, so and that's as true of mainline uh, Christians, as it is people who may not be in mainline denominations, they may consider themselves evangelical inside mainline denominations, or they may be independent. So yes, I mean, I think the dominant culture piece is really about who controls the narrative. And um, what makes them dominant is that they control the story. Not every person in dominant culture uh, believes they have power or even feels they do have power. And many don't, formally speaking, have power. But dominant culture is different than dominant individuals. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. Uh, Dominant culture that I'm referring to is that set of practices which controls the main narrative of America or it controls the main narrative of any given town or workplace or family. And in that narrative, uh, classically in the United States, that narrative has been primarily a white narrative a white normativity kind of driven narrative. It's about what the white history of America has been. It's about what the, what white people have said about the white history of America, uh, rather than actually a much more complicated narrative of of a story of America that is rich with uh, both, both great joys and sadly uh, gives plenty of evidence of great sorrow and abuses of power and neglect and injustice that is all intertwined in that. And um, I think one of the things that I have drawn deeply from over the years has been how much the Bible allows a rich, complicated, and even contradictory narrative to be told about the people of God in the world. And that's not the way that American narratives around the church in America have been told. I think the Bible is actually one of the great voices that calls us to more complicated narratives. So when I wrote that, and, and as I still feel that, um, the dominant narrative has been too singular, it's been too white, it's been too culturally uh, authoritarian in certain ways, controlling in any case. Um, whereas the, the richer narrative um, is obviously a narrative that begins with, uh, with Native Americans. It uh, continues on with uh, 400 years uh, of history of black injust- injustice against blacks. 250 years of slavery, um, all of that, it continues uh, as the West especially experiences um, with the Latino history um, that really was expunged when the United States basically just washed over the top of of sections of what had been Mexico. Um, And then of course it extended uh, with Asian immigration and and control of the Chinese, Exclusionary Act and and many other things that have happened in all of these um, various racial uh, ethnic groups. And so my concern is that evangelicalism has often stood on in the language of the Bible and used it um, to defend what was really not a biblical narrative or a biblical morality or a biblical ethics or a biblical sociology, but a white ethics, a white morality, a white uh, perspective, which has often then claimed its neutrality rather than actually understanding not only its bias, but actually worse than that, its prejudice. Um, and so at, we're at a moment, and there's been other moments in history where this narrative needs to be, has, has been challenged, but we're certainly in a moment right now where it must be challenged. When I was interviewed to be the president of Fuller, and like any such interview, I was asked a question that went something like this, what do you think are the primary issues that will be before you, should you be appointed to be president? And I said, well, there's no doubt to me that the biggest issue is race. Um, that while there's lots of other things that are going on and that need to be considered, the, lar- the largest subversion to the faithful witness of the Christian church in America is the way that the church is complicit in a narrative of, of ignorance and, and prejudice and of 
uh, a distorted narrative of injustice in which the white church comes out uh, as of course the heroes uh, and, the, and every other Christian voice and other cultures in any case and races as well come out in, in uh, much lower status. That has to be rewritten and Fuller has a stake in that. And if we don't know that we have a stake in that, then we're not really paying attention to, uh, to the reality of the change that's really afoot demographically, but also re regardless of the current demographic shifts, the historic uh, unwillingness of the white church in America to be able to come to terms with its own complicity in this kind of racial prejudice is, is a blight on the witness of the church and a subversion to the, to the reign of Jesus. When was that interview that you had with Fuller where you said that, what you just referenced? When, when, when I was being interviewed to become president. So that would have been 2000 and... Yes, what was that? Like 2009-ish. Uh, um, <laughs> so, I mean, no, obviously... Sorry. sorry, 2012 and 13. Okay, 2012 and 13, which is obviously, I mean, racism, racial issues had... Have, were in well in existence at that point, but that was also well before George Floyd, this current moment that we were in. Right. So a heightened right. sensitivity to this pressing issue within the church. Right. Where had you witnessed this yourself? Where had you experienced this? Where had, I mean, everything that you're saying, I, as, as someone who grew up very much so in the evangelical church, um, like resonates with so much of my experience. And so I'm curious as to how it collided with yours. Well, I think, as I said, you know, right from my conversion, it was clear to me that, um, that if you were a follower of Jesus, your sociology was going to be rewritten. And um, my mm -hmm. parents had an, a desire for that. Um, but then I, when I became a Christian, it became part of what I was pursuing every time I was in an opportunity where I felt like I had a chance to really form relationships with people whose sociology, ethnicity, race, ex life experience was really different than my own. I received it as, as, a, as a gift that I, I really wanted to understand and, and just listen to the stories that were not my stories. And um, over time, that, of course, led to, to a number of very profound relationships where um, people are not just telling you, as it were, their public story, but their private story of what it's like to be Black in America or what it's like to be Latino or Asian American. And in that uh, came just very, very deep um, sorrow, honestly. It was, it, was, um, it was mostly something that for years left me primarily just silenced by it. It felt like... Uh, I, I knew the road of activism, activism um, and I honored that, but I wasn't, I didn't know what activism honestly looked like, especially for a tall, white, educated male, right? It was like, uh, what is the job and how, how can this be done in a way that does not seem in its own way um, naturally like it's just another instance of being um, white, normatively pursuing in a way that could be received or be token rather than something that was actually deeper than that. And I think that that began to change as time went on. And, and I had uh, mentors of, of these friends who would invite me into vulnerable spaces in the places where some of the hardest conversations were going. Some of this became something that was a little easier for me to tact when I was uh, involved as I have been for 40 years in international theological education. So as I, as I traveled and had the gift of being able to be in so many places around the world, almost entirely, of course, with people of color, it was like, okay, okay, this is helping me to understand the American story really differently, but I'm now experiencing it by, by these international friends who are telling me their story in those international settings. And then I would come back to the US and go, Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I'm seeing this in so much clearer a way, right? So it kept leading me into this, into that. I think the other thing is white culture tends uh, as a group, uh, not always, of course, it's, it's always very, it's not homogenous, like any cultural group is not homogenous. Um, 
But there's often a tendency for, for white normativity to take over when people of color tell their story. And they say, this is my experience, especially this is my experience of racial prejudice. And I've been in plenty of settings where the white voices have basically said, but wait, 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 I'm sure that that wouldn't have happened if dot, dot, dot. And usually it puts the onus of responsibility or actually blame on the person of color rather than on uh, actually believing their stories. And as that became more and more vivid to me, it became more and more my inner vocation to say, like with any person on, on all kinds of other grounds as well, I am going to trust your narrative period. I'm not going to rewrite it for my own sake. I'm not trying to squeeze your narrative into my narrative. I want my narrative to be affected by your narrative. And I do think that gradually over time, what emerged for me was this sense that, that I, was, I was and am carrying in my body the narratives of people who do not look like me, but they are so in me that I'm not trying to overstate this as though I do this perfectly, but I'm just saying I walk daily with probably six or seven primary stories and then many beyond it, but I'll call it six or seven primary stories that just dwell in my conscious mind, in my body, every day, everywhere I go. Mm. So it feels to me like I am in some sense inhabited Hmm. stories and that has meant the world to me right so that then i i feel like when the recent years have unfolded not least uh the last let's say five or six years especially um it it hasn't felt like playing catch-up it's felt like yeah this is this is what i was saying when i was interviewed for example yeah. um and and this is all the more need then to lean as far into this as possible and to hear the stories at their depth um, and to, um, to actually then engage in a new moment of both reflection uh, and, and activism. So I know there's, sense? yes. I mean, there's 4 million follow-up questions, but I'm gonna go with this one for now. Sorry, Amos, and I'll let you in. Um, so I know this kind of goes against the what you were saying about the dominant cultural narrative, um, but in 2021, it is actually a very pressing question, and especially on this, you talked about hearing the perspectives, carrying the stories of um, beloved friends who are Black American, Asian American, Latino American, Latina American. Um, I'm just going to come right out and ask, what is it like for you? as a straight white man in 2021, how, is, how has this moment, how is this season impacting your identity? Well, I think um, I'll call it the George Floyd summer um, just to put a focus on it. So, um, so in, in that event, and then also in the events that happened leading up to that and then during that summer, um, I have to say probably the primary impact to me was, was depression. Um, I just found it so depressing that this was so prevalent as a part of the United States. And it was, it was I will admit, attached in my mind to uh, the 81% of white evangelicals that voted for Trump. It was part of the burden and anguish of the 75 million Americans that uh, are still um, strongly, strongly, strongly supportive. It's not about Trump. I'm not trying to go down that road at the moment. I, I can go down that road, but that's not my point. It's not about Trump. It's about a kind of mind that, in, as far as I can tell, just does not seem to actually see the same world that I see. And so a lot of it felt to me like sharing the pain and having the protracted conversations with people of color at Fuller, beyond Fuller, these close friends, international friends, as well as American friends, was, um, was really depressing. And, and because it was, I think the reason it felt with even greater depression to me was this feeling that 
that though I am in this role of leadership and though I have this opportunity to speak and though I have a platform that can reach a certain number of, and type of evangelical people and beyond, that the levers of actual change are so diffuse and so problematic, the, the dominant levers, that it, it truly felt like identifying in a very small way with the helplessness of, of what I think many people of color experience all the time over feeling like the world is just really set against this. And how do you live into this with courage? And again, you know, I've said for a long time that the black church is the future, is the hope of the American church. And uh, I certainly believe that that's true. It's not only the black church, but I would say it's the people of color churches um, in, in the, in, within the church in America that are the hope of the church. And the reason for it is that, that the white narrative not dominated world is, is, is at a precipice point where it is going to diminish in numbers to such a degree. And it will fight vigorously uh, to retain that. And, and therefore, um, hearing and understanding and trusting and, and following uh, people of color during that summer and beyond uh, continued to move me into the space of feeling like this is one of the one of the most important periods of my life. This is at a point where I have some of the, the greatest reach that my leadership might have an opportunity to express. And it feels so small compared to the to the depth of the problem and the the significance of the kind of change that's really needed. It's so I think all that just really affects me very deeply. And um, I could go on, but that at least is a part of a response. Hey, the um, the speech in 2018 at Wheaton College, just to return to that, I'm curious, how was it received? Well, it was interesting. Um, first of all, the gathering had, had been told to me when I was invited that it was going to be a small gathering and that it was going to be off the record. And when I got there, it was a larger gathering, not big, but it was a larger gathering than it had been. And literally, I was the first person to speak. Um, and, and or maybe I wasn't the first person to speak, but I was very close to the beginning. And just before I spoke, the, uh, it was announced that, that, this, that, the, that the major speeches, the plenary talks, which is what I was giving, the plenary talks were on the record and the discussion was off the record. Well, I didn't know that. I mean, and I didn't prepare for that, right? I prepared for what I thought was going to be a, a more private conversation. And for a variety of reasons, I didn't want to, you know, upset the apple cart right at the very beginning of the whole thing. So I thought, well, there's nothing in here that I wouldn't say publicly. Um, so I guess I'll just go for it. And it had already begun to be tweeted um, about but when I was, before I was even done talking. So when I got back to my seat and picked up my phone <laughs> it had already begun to explode so so then we i realized quickly that we just had to put out the whole text or otherwise it it, it could easily be misquoted and misunderstood so then almost immediately uh, we just put out the whole thing so i think the response at the meeting itself was i'll call it um receptive cautiously receptive um and, and that disappointed me that though there were black voices there who, some of whom um, I have some of the highest regard for, absolutely the highest regard for. They were of course um, kindred spirits in the, in the response. Um, and, and I felt that their talks uh, also to me felt like they were, they were reservedly affirmed and um, what it, what it did for me was that it intensified even more the sense of the need to keep speaking out. And so what happened after that was that I kept trying to build on the distinctions that I was making and uh, on the need for what I eventually said was that let's, let's affirm the evangel, but give up, um, if not further uh, put to death, the icalisms of even well, icalism. Um, the evangel is our banner, not the icalisms. And the icalisms contain, contain all the, the, the small making, um, often myopic 
social practices uh, which have been defended, but which have been uh, frequently uh, unjust and 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 wrong. So, mm. tell me, Amos, what what um, struck you about that talk that you would bring it up? Was it that line, or was it? There are multiple lines. Yeah, no, I, I read it fervently. I was, it, it, you know, I know Wheaton College, and you know, yeah, I, I've, got, I've got a uh, passing familiarity with uh, evangelicalism, at least you know the the more formal institutions that yeah. are related to it. I yeah. call myself an evangelical. I mean, if anybody were to ask me, but nobody is asking me these days. So, um, but yeah, uh, the um, There was another line. I mean, uh, very early on in the in the in the uh, the talk, where you said the central crisis facing us is that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been betrayed and shamed by an evangelicalism that has violated its own moral and spiritual integrity. Um, and uh, in the midst of like this, you know, collective reckoning that we're all kind of doing, especially those of us that are in positions of power, you know no matter what our color is. Uh, I have found that it's easier for me to um, uh, be a third party observer, you know, stand apart from situations and be able to, you know, analyze and, and, yes. and um, provide commentary. What's been harder for me is really identifying where I have been complicit, just mm -hmm. me personally, like, you know, day to day, in right. my relationships, in my exercise of authority or power or leadership, you know, within right. institutions, where exactly have I been complicit? Uh, so uh, I set that before you and say, is that, um, uh, is it, how does that exercise work out for you? You know, not, not just looking at the whole church broadly uh, and the evangelical movement broadly, but your own journey with Jesus following yeah his way. Um, yeah. Well, I do think uh, it's a great question. I, and I do think it's a never ending question really. Um, so I, I receive it in that way. Um, and I, I think it, it helps to have really honest people who are both friends and collaborators, uh, people inside Fuller officially part of the staff and the faculty and so forth, uh, and part of the community beyond that. So I think part of it is trying to, is, trying to establish and maintain and continue as open a posture as possible about what I have yet to learn, right? So I, I do want people to speak to me about the places where my leadership, my attitude, my voice, um, my actions or my inactions uh, are, not, are not up to what they would expect or think they should be. Um, and I think you have to be you have to be ready, of course, for that. And some of that has been blistering, uh, I'll say, and public. And some of it has been um, quieter, but no less um, candid in really naming the places where I have a, a long ways to go and a lot to learn. So I do think I can say that I earnestly try to live in a posture of learning. So I'm not... I'm not posing myself uh, as, as something that I'm not. I, I still get all the benefits of being a tall, white, educated male. Like I, I walk into the world every day with that. Um, I do walk into the world of, of that, um, being conscious that that is true and that, that is, uh, that's, that's mostly going to be uh, a set of challenges for how the day is gonna unfold and for how I might be distorting uh, what other people are saying to me or Am I really hearing and am I hearing, am I really even hearing the voices that I really think I am hearing? Am I hearing deeply enough those voices or am I still hearing a little too, um, a little too comfortably to actually allow the impact of what they're saying to actually go deeper and then to try to honestly work out sometimes with them, sometimes it's not appropriate to work it out with them, but, it, but to have a sounding board community, which for me is a small group that I'm a part of in a senior leader that where we try to all bring uh, as much candor to that as possible. Now that includes, it's made up of four people, three of them are people of color. So, um, 
So Fuller's uh, chief academic officer, it's, it's COO, and it's uh, and its two deans are both are, are both are all people of color. So I'm the only white person in that circle. And what that because there's such candor and honest um, honesty among us, um, that has been a really helpful place. I feel like we've leaned in as as deeply as we can, but we keep wanting to press it further. I do, and we do, and um, and I want to learn. I mean, I I uh, I don't want to be defensive. Um, about those things. And I want to, but I also want, I think this is the other part that's delicate. If you're going to do it really honestly, there has to be a mutuality of exchange, right? So that it's not just me, as it were, being told you as the white person need to change in this or that way. All that's probably true. But if it's actually going to be a real relationship, which it is, then, then, it, then it also has to include my ability to be able to speak back about that, not out of defensiveness, but out of calling all of us, uh, myself included, um, to, to a more subtle and complicated picture. I mean, I, you know, I've often used that wonderful um, video by Chimamanda Adichie, uh, The Danger of the Single Story, uh, which is just such a remarkable TED talk. And, and it plays ubiquitously. I mean, I don't know of a group you can't play that for and be challenged, whatever the issue is that you're talking about, because one story, one narrative is just not sufficient. In these conversations, um, that has to be an ongoing mutuality of narratives rather than my narrative against their narrative or their narratives against my narrative. That's, that's not called communication. That's just called target practice, potentially at its worst. Um, Instead, what it needs to become is, is this, you know, much richer, textured, multi-layered, intertwined narrative in which um, our stories, our collective and individual stories, are being rewritten. Um, so the goal is not the expungement of, for example, of white people having a voice in public squares and leadership. That that is not the goal. The goal is mutuality. The goal is justice. The goal is equity. The goal is uh, candor, honesty, and most wonderfully, I mean, this is the thing that that just you know, I, it, it has to be full of joy. Ultimately, I mean, to me, what drives this, in addition to simply the passion for justice, because that's the character of God, is actually the pain of this kind of work. But beyond the pain, the incredible joy of, of now a world inhabited by so many people that are not like me. Mm -hmm. And the discovery that the character of the church, of course, in Ephesians 2, is meant to be a communion of unlike people who are brought together only because of Jesus Christ. That's just like, this is beyond thrilling to me. And, uh, and I've experienced that. I do experience that. I experience it every day. Um, and why would you not want to live in that world? <laughs> so, so I, I mean, that's, that's actually my question is, I mean, that is so clearly painted in scripture, this diversity. Right. Um, and yet, at least in my experience, and so this is just me copying to my individual experience, particularly within the church that I grew up in with an evangelical church was this desire for this neutral gospel, this uniform yeah. experience yeah. Um, that tends to place that as a higher value than the individual experiences that we each have, given the color of our skin, given our socioeconomic status, given the places that we're from. Yeah. What drives this fear of that diversity? What theological premise is, I mean, I still can't understand it. I don't think it is a theological premise. I think it's a, it's a sociological premise. And okay. um, in the book that I uh, edited, <clears throat> edited called Still Evangelical, question mark, in the, the first chapter of that book is a chapter by me about the fact that so much of this really has to do with social location, nothing to do with our Christology, nothing to do with our understanding of the reign of God and justice and mercy uh, and love. It's, it's a sociology which has then been baptized by the gospel um, mm -hmm. in a way that has, I think, um, woefully uh, at times actually desecrated 
the gospel rather than actually honored it. And our life has not been changed by the gospel. It's that our sociology has uh, changed the evangel. That's the exact reverse of what's intended. So I do think that all of us, and this is definitely all of us, not just uh, white people, all of us have to ask, how are we allowing the, the, the gospel to actually rewrite our narratives? How are we allowing it to change and open ourselves to the other? And you know, I have certainly experienced, I'm sure you have probably as well, um, not only the prejudice inside the US, but I think of prejudice inside many, many other countries that are racial um, out of their own sociology as well, where they may have a dominant Christian culture that is multiracial, but there are hierarchies in nations in Africa, for example, around tribalisms, and there are hierarchies in Asia, and there are hierarchies in, in Central and South America that are every bit as virulent as American white um, domination can be. Um, and so the, the, what it really does is call out for all of us the need to, to let our sociologies be renewed, revised, remade. This is why Romans 12, one and two, we need to be re changed by the renewing of our perception. That's my understanding of the word in that text. It's not our brains, but our perception. Am I able to perceive others through the eyes of Jesus? That is a completely different way of, of engaging faith. But that means then that it's not about our sociology. It's, it's about the God that we're serving whose heart and perception is radically different than our own. So I don't, I don't justify it theologically. I don't think it has a justification theologically. Mark, a question just came, came in a little while ago uh, from Marilee Mitchell. Uh, she yeah. says, J J Jamar Tisby suggests that new seminaries staffed by black indigenous people of color need to be started to get at the root of the complicity problem within the white church, do you agree? Well, I certainly don't disagree. I mean, um, whether the world can support more seminaries is another question that has as much to do with the, yeah. the uh, economics you, you, of education. If you, disagreed, if you disagreed, that moment would go viral. You know? Yes. <laughs> so, I don't, yeah. Yeah. so I'm, I'm like, go for it. If that, if that is sustainable, <laughs> I am for that. Um, but in the, so amen to that. Go go in that direction. At the same time, I'd say yes, but it's also true that seminaries have to be rewritten by a deep BIPOC um, awareness and, and transition in staffing faculty curriculum, et cetera. And, you know, I'm super grateful for where we've come to at this stage at, at Fuller's Life in that. We've made, honestly, under the leadership of, of a many deeply rooted, com long-time committed people of color at Fuller, faculty, staff, administration, et cetera. Um, we, are, we have really, really changed our social location and our ability to serve. There are six ethnic centers across the ethnic centers. There's this um, deep sense of, of letting these voices fully at the table. Those voices are at all of the major tables of Fuller, our board, our senior team, our faculty team. The, the, the faculty leadership council. I mean, it's, it's a really, really different day and we're not satisfied. Um, so let's keep going. So for example, there's a, a cluster hire that we're wanting to do next summer in a number of different disciplines, which we hope will further uh, add to the color of our faculty in uh, various ways and in various parts, mainstream parts of Fuller, not, um, not kind of specialized program areas, but but primary faculty. So uh, yes, both and to what was, I, I think, asked about. So I'm super encouraged to hear about um, what's happening at Fuller. Uh, for the people who are on tuning into this podcast, parishioners, members, staff, leaders in the church, uh, what are some things that, I mean, I think this, all of these discussions, and as we were talking about how First Pres did GCC this past weekend, all of these questions, discussions, conversations keep coming down to, so what can we be doing? Um, what is What lies ahead in terms of um, reversing this dominant narrative in um, embracing this idea of a richer uh, 
more diverse church. Uh, what's your advice to, to churches as a, as a pastor? Well, let me start with the individuals rather than the churches. Um, I, I honestly think when Pew came out with that study, I think it was about three years ago, that most uh, white people, something like 85% of white Americans do not have any close relationship with a person um, that is not white. Um, that was for me sort of a jaw dropper because um, the question wasn't, do you have relationships with people or do you have contact with people? It was, do you have close friends? Um, and for it to be that high, it just suggests that how could we possibly think of something pervasively, deeply transformative until we actually know one another? <laughs> so honestly, I feel like <coughs> that may be the most, um, the most important single thing that anyone uh, that might be listening to this could possibly do is to, to, with honor and dignity, not with tokenism, seek to get to know people who are not like you especially in racial, ethnic, or class terms. Mm. Um, I can think of many people who have been uh, examples of this to me, many actually in, in the Berkeley church, as I'm sure there are such people also at, at First Press in Dallas. Um, really significant leaders to me in showing me how to keep doing this. So part of it is that. Letting and letting their stories become part of your story in that way that I was trying to describe. Um, and I think, I think if you don't have any natural way to do that, it may also be an absence of having actually engaged in your wider world. So um, it may be if they don't, if you don't have any such opportunities, then that is its own perhaps barometric pressure uh, indicator about um, how your world, whether intentionally or accidentally or whatever it might be, has gotten itself accidentally uh, or purposely isolated. Um, so where else and how else do you want to find your community, your people, your the, the town that you live in? Um, I've been in towns where people have said to me, you know, it's an all white town. And I go, it's actually not. I mean, I've only been here for five hours. <laughs> I've already seen plenty of evidence of the fact that that's just not a true narrative. I mean, um, there's actually a lot of people, they may not be in your economic status. Mm -hmm. They may not be in your immediate world, but they are not, not here. Right? right. So what could you join? What could you become a part of? What, where could you volunteer? Where do you participate? What club might you join? What um, service effort might you become a part of um, for the sake of the service itself, but also for the sake of genuinely coming to know one another. Um, now that's going to expand I, that. So I think, I think the, honestly, that's the single most important thing. I think church, um, church to church connections, for example, I think can be really very meaningful. And I know this is part of your friendship. It's part of what you're doing together as two churches. I applaud and encourage that. Certainly the fact that it's you two leading that exercise will be very different, uh, frankly, than it might be if it was two uh, white pastors trying to get congregations to be partners or a, classically a white and black pastor trying to do that. Um, I think that has its place and it sometimes can work. There certainly are examples of that. I think, um, I think it's not so much by direct contact this way that that work should be done. I think it has to be direct contact that way. How do we join together as two different congregations in a third project, mm -hmm. which is not the thing that we're actually, which is the thing that we're looking at rather than looking at each other. And as we look at this other need in our community, for example, and, and engage together in that, um, we simply discover, we have the opportunity to potentially discover each other. Mm -hmm. And we do it in side-by-side -side play, right? I mean, this is how child development works. Children become friends once they go through a period of learning to play side-by-side -side with each other. They're not yet, if we're, if we're really early in this game, we're not yet experienced enough to be able to have straight ahead conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it may be way better to just find something that we're gonna be regularly committed to jointly, and we're there for that third purpose. And in that context, we have a chance to learn the capacities that it takes to actually turn and have a, as it were, a face-to-face -face 
uh, engagement, either as a community of individuals or as two bodies of people. Um, I would say that one of the things on that note, though, that that happened at First Press that I would I would want to give uh, great honor to the people who were in, instrumental in making this happen was that they orchestrated um, getting a, a, a church that Fuller was not a close partner with, but had certainly friendly relationships with, um, which was a black church in Oakland. And, and they invited about eight or more people to come and spend a night with the, just the pastors of First Press, who at the time were all white, not all male, but they were all white. Um, and to talk about what it means to be black in the East Bay. So um, probably that conversation lasted, as I remember it, for two or three hours. Um, why they were willing to share this, um, I can only say was, was a gift of grace. I would now, right now, I probably wouldn't even do that exercise um, because it, it would feel too um, problematic on so many different levels. Um, but especially because we didn't know each other. Um, but at that time, it worked. And it certainly worked for me and for a, a number of the other people that were there that were, were part of First Press staff, because it was really being invited not only to listen to their stories, but then even more uh, to my embarrassment, really, because of the kinds of questions that we all felt compelled to ask, but which, honestly, in retrospect, <laughs> made me feel chagrined that we that we asked that, but it was, you know, the kind of naive question that frankly we needed to ask that is so tiresome and brutal, I think, to people of color, um, but it made major headway. And, um, but now I would call that predatory if there weren't mm. already relationships that were in place um, where now let's say you've done a third project together and now you're having an evening um, probably not as large as that evening, but uh, an evening where you're having intimate conversations about really painful things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate you naming how that, I mean, I've been a part of those exchanges years ago and already now realizing that they, they are perceived differently, they probably wouldn't happen in the same way. Right. Um, and so, Amos, I actually I have the final question for you. Let's say everyone takes um, the Reverend Dr. Mark Laberton's advice and seeks and, and starts pursuing friendship. And you and I have, have shared that after George Floyd's murder, after the Atlanta shootings, we had people coming at us left, right and center right. for conversation. So in this earnest desire to actually I mean, this is how it, the, the needle moves is in relationship. And so I'm asking you as a black man, for someone who is pursuing genuine relationship with you, and I mean, let's just say it, a white person pursuing genuine relationship with you, what, it, what are things that they, that it would be good for them to know? While you think about that, Amos, I want to have Charlene answer the same question. Okay. <laughs> but um, we all eat, I think, uh, just start there. It's really, I, I wish I had a more theologically like complex or, you know, sophisticated uh, response, but, well, you know, I, I eat, I like food, let's eat together and um, just make that commitment to each other. Um, and uh, yeah, um, my say beyond that. You know, food food is a great equalizer, and uh, we I think that's uh, consistent with um, um, with the gospel text um, that uh, we explore on a, a weekly basis together, and um, consistent with um, you know our sacramental practices as well. So yeah, we can always um, start there. yeah. I don't I, I don't think I mean, I, I agree. And um, I have had plenty of meals with people where I have left the dinner emptier than I arrived. So to me, food is not going to solve the problem. Um, I, I would say that as an Asian woman, I probably need to be asked a question five times in order to believe that the person is actually interested in my answer. Um, and so as, as a 
as I'm engaging in that friendship, it's going to take trust, a lot of trust to be built that um, the engagement isn't exactly like what you're talking about and naming really honestly, thank you, Mark, just a token you get, here's my friend of color, right? Um, how serious are you about hearing my experience and not only hearing, but like what you're saying, being transformed by it? Um, because I think that so much of my history has included sharing my story as it complements the dominant narrative and not conflicts it with it, right? Um, and so in order for me to, to share honestly, hey, this is my story that's actually going to be in tension now with yours, I need to believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is a safe space um, and that this isn't just a, a thing that you're checking off your checklist towards, you know, you know, being a better person in this uh, post George Floyd world. Um, and so for me, that's what I would need someone who is genuinely earnestly seeking relationship um, with me as a person of color to know. You know, I just, I, I think uh, uh, without being a, a necessary mediator, I think both of you are right. The, the meals can be a great place, but as you say, I've had meals that have been more death bringing than life bringing as well, where you feel as though they, people didn't come to it honestly, but as you're suggesting Amos, if they do, and if you can actually really have an honest conversation. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they come honestly or not, or dishonestly, at least when we eat together, I will know, and I'll never have another, another meal with them again, <laughs> you know? So it's, They're it not. is revealing. Yeah. There is a revelation yeah. that occurs. Yes at yes. the table and it's quick yes. it's an easier and quicker way to get to that moment of truth right than it is to you know uh, gather around some kind of formal discussion yes. uh yes. where people's you know um right. desires or their their angles are a little bit more hidden um you there's nowhere to hide at the table right that's that's very true let me say to some white people that might be listening to this don't expect such meals to be your opportunity to have uh your people, uh, the people of color that you might be meeting with, educate you. That's a different conversation. They're mm. not there as your teachers. Don't set them up to have to speak for all Asian people, all black people, all Latino right. people, et cetera. Like that is not the way it works. Do your own homework. Um, but if you're going to listen, then you have to listen and trust the stories that are being heard and not, not try to make it fit your narrative. Like right. that's not, not the point. It, your narrative is, at least in some initial stages, not even remotely on the table. It's simply the narrative of, of the people that you're trying to understand and, and get to genuinely know and hear from. Um, to me, that creates at least the possibility of more than one meal. Yeah. <laughs> that way. <laughs> Otherwise, I think you're right, Amos. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, why would you flagellate yourself by subjecting yourself to more than one meal if there's just no there there no actual engagement yeah 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 i appreciate I, you saying that go ahead Amos. no i'm done well so, so we told you mark that you know if the conversation is good we'll be wrapping up at you know 450 650 if the conversation is really good we're gonna go that full hour and we've gone beyond the hour because um from the moment we started i've appreciated your honesty, your frank honesty about um, the things that the church at large, evangelical, mainline, whatever, you know, whatever qualifier we're going to give it, the church at large is struggling with, the culture at large, the world at large is struggling with. So we thank you for being in community, in dialogue, in friendship with us. I have so appreciated your friendship, um, particularly this this first and past and um, crazy pandemic year um, and your leadership in at Fuller and the way that it's impacting churches everywhere. So thank you for just, yes, for being with us this evening. Uh, friends, we will gather again in November 
on the 14th, I believe is the date with Dr. Christine Hong, who is a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. So we thank you for tuning in this evening for your questions, for your uh, thoughts, for your gratitude that has been also streaming into the chat as well. Um, and we look forward to being with you all uh, in a month. So thank can you, just, friends. Can I just say yeah. a thanks before we actually tune out, just to say what an honor it's, it is to get to be with both of you. I'm, I'm so glad for your friendship. Um, I'm so glad for the way that it, I hope, is an encouragement to each of you and has been to me in uh, the a prior conversation we had and again today, and how important it is that you're doing these conversations. I mean, honestly, this is like real stuff. And it uh, you know, when we're part of, as all three of us are part of the PCUSA, a denomination that's been given, giving itself to these kinds of concerns for 40 or 50 years, and yet is still 90 plus percent white as a denomination. That's just a very, very sobering statement yeah. about the depth of what we're talking about. Namely, it's really hard to live out a different sociology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just believe that God's desire to be in a communion of unlike people and where, where that's not possible for demographic reasons that's one thing or where it's necessary for there to be homogeneity because of other legitimate demographic reasons that's also understandable but where it is really just a sociological phenomenon and not actually a necessity let alone a desire uh, I just pray that God will give all three of us the opportunity to exercise leadership that will keep extending um, the richness of what God intends for our communities to know. So thank you very much. Charlene, I do pray for you. I prayed in the search process and in this absolutely absurd and crazy year of beginning your time at First Press, I can't even begin to imagine. And Amos, I'll see you the next time I'm in Dallas. I'm very glad I'll get to do so. Thank you. Good Thanks. to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone.